Hello everyone, and now we move to the romantic uh, chapter. Obviously, great things... Sorry, had a yawn there. Obviously, great things are happening with uh, literature, philosophy. Um, while we don't have time to discuss all of those things, and there are classes devoted to the romantic languages and literature of that time, uh, they are, what you need to understand is how much of an influence it is. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's uh, philosophy served not only to fuel the French Revolution, but an artistic revolution as well. A really a profound one uh, as we move on. Looking at architecture, architecture will not play a strong role in this chapter, but we can see uh, revivals in the different periods, as well as an interest in another country. Instead of Chernasuri and things from Japan, India is now sparking you know, works of art in the form of architecture and so forth. Um, it's not to say that it's a fascination with everything Indian, but we can see that uh, a break away from what was usually being made has now been expanded to include um, things from India. <laughs> Without getting into too much detail, we'll just leave it at that, because there are classes devoted to non-Western art and non-Western architecture in sculpture. Um, really, the best way to summarize this would be looking at the neoclassical as the classical Greek influence and the romantic being more that emotional Hellenistic style than Hellenistic approach in so much as there being a strong presence of diagonal movements, implied movement energy, and expressive dramatic emotion. You know, here uh, the departure of the volunteers, that woman above, seems to be the personification of victory, victory leading the young and old, the firm and infirm alike, to, you know, their cause. And that, that in and of itself is a rather romantic notion of everyone taking arms, everyone uh, affecting change looking back and thinking about the philosophies that were influential at that time, the idea of the people coming together and uh, affecting change does make sense, and you can see how it is connected, perhaps. In painting, that's where we're going to spend most of the rest of our time looking at the different branches of the Romantic chapter. Uh, obviously, here, William Blake has presented a, a rather non-traditional depiction of God, as God breaks the clouds away, or rather produces the light and the darkness, uh, and begins to plot the world, creating the universe with not just laser beam light from the sun, but from what, you know, kind of repeats that ray of light of the sun in his hand with a compass. If you look closely, you'll see that it is in fact a compass and not necessarily laser beams. Moving on to something else very different is a question, not necessarily a question, but something that breaks away from the tradition of painting in general. You know, what was painting before? Painting was something to, to educate, yeah, for the sake of religious painting, sure, to decorate. Here's a pretty vase, here's a pretty flower, this is a beautiful landscape, to... Um, glorify, whether it's religious or uh, political. Here, and of course, there was sarcastic artwork, making a commentary. Uh, here, um, social justice is being addressed. Whereas a corporation, in the case, the, the company that owned the ship that was the Medusa, uh, crashed, uh, began to sink. Uh, people, only the people that could get on, the higher ranking uh, members, got on the life rafts, and made it away, seeming to tell a story that they were the only ones who survived, when in fact, there were 15 survivors. Men crowded together on a raft, began eating each other after they died, or presumably after they died, some men, you know, mourning their son. We see some classical references here. This is uh, one of the traditional poses of mourning. We've seen that before with the... Uh, First Nations uh, tribesmen 
mourning the death of General, General Wolf. I almost said Jennifer Wolf. General Wolf. Here we see the father mourning the body of his son. Jericholt here uh, wanted to bring the light, the injustice that was the survivors. Now you're thinking, Mr. Fernandez, the no one survived. Well, the doctor on that boat that made it uh, couldn't sleep at night and his conscience got the better of him and he broke the news. This is a horrible tragedy uh, that they would just leave these men behind. And so he seeks to bring to light uh, using his art as a, way, as a, as a flashlight on uh, issues rather than just being a pretty picture. And when you add to the fact that this content, the subject matter, is not something we traditionally looked at before. You know, we don't necessarily look at paintings of, we didn't before, rather, look at paintings of death and desperation. The emotion, the movement in it, it's, it's really a rather uh, graphic bit of content and subject matter when compared to the previous works. Now, is this simply a dark and tragic painting? Well, if you look really closely, you'll see that there is a bit of hope on the horizon. As all these men clamor and wave their shirts and wave bits of fabric, they are trying to gain the attention of this boat on the horizon. And believe it or not, some of them do get rescued. While there are several dead bodies on the raft, more in the water, some survived that were not on the original life raft. Looking at the painting on the, the uh, left, we can see the portrait of a mad woman. Now, some people might think, well, how do you know she's a mad woman? You could, you know, t take a look at the hair, the look in her eye, the way her eyes are bloodshot, the smile. Clearly, she's either giving someone the greasy eyeball or, you know thinking of doing something. She's not just sitting there like that blank stare that Napoleon had. Something is on her mind. When you discover that she was in fact a baby killer, well, that kind of adds things. That kind of makes things different. Um, what is he doing here? He's presenting a different type of subject. Oh, it's a portrait. Oh, it's a portrait of a baby killer. Um, bringing to light those that were ignored or those that were simply put away, um, Jericholt here begins to paint subjects from uh, hospitals and asylums. And obviously uh, the conditions and safety standards have changed in the last hundred plus years. Moving from that to something uh, even more uh, playing on the idea of emotions is Delacroix. Well, something else I want you to be aware of is look at how the paint is being handled. While here the painting is fairly tight, um, you know, color is starting to play more of a prominent role and have an effect in how we read these images. In the portrait of the madwoman or the madwoman with envy, the brushstrokes are still pretty tight. We don't see many uh, brushstrokes overall. We can begin to see it in the background, but when we move to Delacroix, we do see a more expressive handling, a more painterly handling of the paint, whether it is the Turks and the Greeks here, uh, Greeks on the left, Turks on the horses. Again, is this a social justice? Is this tragedy or the, the suffering of the Greek people under the tyranny of the Turks? Um, or if we look at victory, oh, no, that's not victory. Sorry. Uh, if we look at victory, uh, leading liberty, leading the people, bare-breasted in full saturated color in comparison to the uh, desaturated murky background of the, the smoky ruin. There's this romantic notion of everyone coming together once again, both young and old, firm and infirm. While the red, white, and blue leads the way, we can see that the colors have somewhat faded for those that have passed and those looking for hope. Bearing those same colors, the, the play on color of red, white, and blue has continued throughout the piece here and there in small and greater amounts. But in this, we can see uh, a loose and tight handling of the paint, a rather quicker, uh, more immediate approach to the subject matter. And so this is going to uh, herald a, more of a trend towards expressive painting, 
uh, quicker painting, rather, however you want to phrase it, um, leading up to real abstraction. In Spain, and we have someone who is often considered one of the last of the great masters until we reach, say, uh, the late 19th, early 20th century. The great masters of that that older tradition, uh, Goya. Goya, who's quite popular with a lot of metal bands for his images of demons and dark uh, macabre images from his time in an asylum and so forth. Here, though, he captures tragedy in the 3rd of May. Now, if you remember, Spain clung strong, clung strongly to that uh, Christian tradition. The, they stuck with the church throughout the Reformation. Here, the, they're using a lot of religious images following the Christian language, using, you know, that crucifixion pose here and again down here with the image of the church standing strong in the background, connecting the church, connecting the images of Christ before these faceless, feckless thugs with their uh, bayoneted rifles pointed directly toward him. The white innocence, the fact that he is bathed in light speaks to his innocence, his goodliness. Uh, it's really a strong image to this massacre from the 3rd of May. So, is it all heavy-handed doom and gloom drama? No, it's not. Um, there's something else that's happening in the romantic chapter, and that is something I mentioned at the beginning, this idea of the sublime. Um, we begin to look at that with Caspar David Friedrich, and I believe I talked about, well, we talked about this painting at the beginning of the semester, and how to judge and perceive work. You know, there's something to be said about the beauty of nature. Sometimes it transcends, um, it transcends description. To put it another way, maybe, think about this. Um... Some of you might have seen a dog that is so ridiculously ugly, so so mangy, it's, it's cute. You can't take your eye off of it. Same thing can be said for a person. Maybe you find a person so horribly unattractive, you can't help but look. You're like, wow, you're so ugly. I have to look at you. you that Like that uh, car wreck... Uh, desire to look at the car wreck. We we want to look at something that is so extreme. It could be someone that you consider ugly. It could be someone that you consider beautiful. The same thing is there. Caspar David Friedrich attempts to depict the sublime in relation to man here. While these men admire the moon, they admire the beauty of the moon, the beauty of the nature, and that is a rather sublime thing. The aesthetic of the sublime becomes a more plays more prominent role in subject matter uh, from here on in the chapter, and obviously it's going to continue to be a factor in other artists' works. Now, this work here by Constable is not the one in the book. I I simply posted this one for the sake of personal taste. Um, I think that this captures the fire in a much more effective manner. Uh, when you look at this, you see how small man is dwarfed against the, uh, sorry, not Constable Turner, I was looking at the one, Turner has captured uh, the dwarfing of man against the burning House of Lords and Commons, the smoke, it is not that photographic, linear accuracy, it is rather an expressive, loose, painterly, emotional group of textures. Those textures work together to, you know, create this this object that kind of, you know, it implies, but it's not very specific. I think here we can see the beginnings, or at least some of the seeds for Impressionism, whereas it doesn't give us that perfect image like a photograph, it implies or gives us the impression of this massive structure on fire the the roaring smoke, the movement of the smoke, whether it is a carefully mixed and rubbed in texture of colors or simply flat, immediate daubs of paint right on top of that. It's really a really a great piece of looking at the development towards abstraction. I mean, how do you successfully, expressively paint fire? That's a tough question that man has been trying to tackle for centuries, really. 
Meanwhile, in America, we have some wonderful... Um, the United States has a wonderful tradition of landscape painting, whereas the United States doesn't have massive cathedrals, churches, um, you know, other works of architecture. What we do have is nature lots of it and before the invention of the camera we had artists to travel about the states and capture the beauty of the states capture the romantic sublime overwhelming vistas that you know this nation has to offer whether you like the tempest the storm and the fury the beauty of the the sound and the fury so to speak of the storm or the heavy silence of manless nature Thomas Cole here has shown how small man is before uh, this vista and this power that is the storm which breaks trees and destroys without without prejudice where's the man the man is here there's another man here and so when you look at this perhaps you can imagine um, the occasional artist carrying the French easel box and they're called French easel boxes for a reason that ties back to the academic tradition, the academic learning, and how France has such, such a profound influence for artists around the world. Carrying that easel box and the canvas rolled up on his back, finding that perfect spot, and then painting. It is this work by Cole which leads us into um, an even, well, in my opinion, an even more profound work of the natural sublime that the United States has to offer, the work of Albert Bierstadt. Here in uh, Yosemite Valley, the heavy silence of manless nature is without doubt. You have the sunlight, you have the beams of light cresting over that little cliff, and some of you might be thinking, well, Mr. Fernandez, that doesn't look very painterly or colorful, it looks you know, like a photograph. Yes, it does. But Romanticism is not uh, limited strictly to the handling of paint. Romanticism is also about subject, um, context, you know, all of those things come together in the Romantic period. Uh, and so we end hopefully with that note or that idea of what is Romantic, uh, whether it is the sublime, you know, fear can evil can be beautiful or um, you know why do people become fascinated with the bad guys or why do people become fascinated with the good guys this the philosophy uh, we could have a little bit of conversation about that what I want you to understand is the romantic notion of the sublime the romantic notions that are behind these paintings what does that say about art it says that the direction that we make art from is shifting it's not changing to only one reason, but it is expanding. Why we make art is coming into question. Why do we make it before? We made it to decorate. We made it for bling. We made it to glorify, to educate, to dictate, to present our opinion. And now uh, another slot has been opened. Well, I want to make art to capture this. And that's a fairly romantic notion. Perhaps it's most easily understood when we look at the folk art of Edward Hicks. And what is folk art? Folk art is made by untrained people. Now that's, that's a rather revolutionary thing. Think about what John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau were talking about, the social contract or the contract between man and government. Man has a contract or an obligation not to his government, but to, other, but to man himself. How is that applicable to artists? It's applicable in this way. Man has an obligation to go to the academy and study the academic tradition because that is how you make art. That is why you make art. That is where and what you make art about. Enter Edward Hicks and other folk, art, folk artists. Why do I have to go to the academy? Why do I have to make art that way? Listen, dude, I'm a carpenter, but I want to paint, so I'm going to paint. That in and of itself is another great leap forward in the thinking of what an artist is. Uh, looking to our own culture 20 years ago or 50 years ago, to be an artist, you had to go to New York. If you wanted to be an actor, you had to go to Los Angeles. If you make it there, you can make it anywhere. 
Well, the folk artists and the naive artists didn't really hold true to that. It's not that they were... Some might have been making a philosophical statement saying, I don't have to do this. Others simply made art because they wanted to. And so we have a rather romantic um, vision of what America, the United States, can or could or perhaps was in the beginning. On the right side, you have um, predator and prey sitting together, resting together, frolicking, perhaps, uh, next to children. Children being uh, symbols of innocence, purity, uh, a veritable Eden of sorts with these animals here in this garden. On the left side, you have a uh, pilgrim, or rather, white man or European with members of the First Nations. So, on the left side, the question as the question could be asked, which one is predator and which one is prey? You know, um, from one perspective, the the members of the First Nations, they're the predators. They're these savages that, you know, come and do this and that. Or on the other hand, uh, you could see the white people, the Europeans, as the predators coming to take the resources and you know do this, that, and the other, take the land. But there is an idea, there is an idea that's rather romantic that this new land, the new land that is the uh, North, the Americas, uh, is big enough for everyone. Everyone can come together and grow and prosper, and this peaceable kingdom is the promise of the United States, which is a fairly romantic notion. Uh, obviously, the American Romantic writers had a strong influence on artists in the States, and while we could spend time talking about them, we're not going to, I would simply encourage you to look into it. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful little window into the history of the United States and uh, some influential writing. So if you have any time during the summer or the winter break, I would encourage you to pick up some books, whether it's the writings of Rousseau, Locke, or the American Romantic writers. Uh, I went through this rather quickly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom back here. I want you to look at the contrast between the neoclassical, that classical, academic, stiff, well, not necessarily stiff, well, visually sometimes stiff, but rather dignified and elegant view versus the dynamic, diagonal, expressive, Hellenistic, uh, that Hellenistic perspective that is the more romantic tradition. When you look at the romantics, I want you to think about, you know, what it is that is exotic. So obviously, those faraway lands offer promise, adventure, riches, opportunities. Whether it's a peaceable kingdom or a wild frontier, there's something romantic about adventure. Uh, we typically identify with that as children or as teenagers wanting to go here. Wow, man, Arkansas is so boring. I want to go here. I want to go here. I want to, I want to live. I want to go and do this. That romantic notion is captured in some of the minds and images of these uh, artists. Now, another thing that's happening in the romantic chapter, again, is, um, you know, why art is being made, how art is being made. That is changing as well. So, understanding those changes, recognizing and understanding them, is really important, because the seeds for abstraction and coming up, Impressionism, are going to grow and bear fruit. So be aware of that. And as always, let me know if you have any questions. I hope this helped. I hope it made sense. And I'll see you in class. Thanks a lot.